So if I could have your attention, we're going to get started. Hopefully you can hear uh, the microphone is working properly. So good, good afternoon, um, everyone. My name is Willie McKether, and I'm the chancellor of the East Falls campus. Um, this is my sixth week. And, and so I'm continuing to, to learn, and, and I'm very pleased to be here uh, this evening to offer this welcome. So welcome to the Jefferson Humanities Forum with Akil Reed Amar. Thank you for joining us, whether you're here in person at the Canbar Campus Center or tuning in to live broadcast online. This is the fourth year of the Humanities Forum, which as many of you may know, explores a dedicated theme throughout the year by hosting five visiting speakers whose work reflects a deep and rich connection to the theme. Our theme this year is origins, and we are very fortunate to be joined by an acclaimed scholar, Akil Reed Amir Amar, Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University. He is one of the nation's leading constitutional historians and legal analysts, as well as the author of several studies of the US Constitution, including his 2021 book, The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 through 1840. The Humanities Forum is organized by the staff of the Jefferson Humanities and Health Center in Center City, and I wanna give a special thanks to them for their work in organizing the event and Professor Amar's visit. So please just give them a hand. Tonight's event is co-sponsored with the College of Humanities and Sciences as part of the Dietrich V. Esting Lectureship. This endowed series was established to sponsor le uh, lectures in the humanities, sciences, arts, and government. Its namesake, Dietrich V. Esting was a native of Belgium who came to the United States, who built his one-man textile company into a much larger corporate entity with five corporations and production facilities across the globe. He served on the Board of Trustees of Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science, as Philadelphia University was known back then, uh, prior to becoming Jefferson East Falls. But, Est but Esteen's interests ranged more widely than textiles. He was also for many years a member of the American Anthroposophic Society. As an anthropologist, I should be able to get that out really easily. Um, an organization uh, interested deeply in holistic approaches to both spiritual and civic life. Those interests are reflected strongly in the lectureships design content areas. Each visiting speaker for the Jefferson Humanities Forum is matched with a forum with a forum scholar from the Jefferson faculty. Joining Professor Amar in conversation tonight after his talk is Evan Lane, Associate Professor of History and Director of the Law and Society Program in the College of Humanities and Societies as well as faculty director of the Arlen Spectrum Center. Evan, thank you, and I will hand it off to you. Uh, thank you so much to Professor Amar for being with us tonight and for all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Chancellor McKetha. Greatly appreciate you giving the qualifications because it goes on quite long for our distinguished guests today. Um, I had the pleasure of spending an afternoon with uh, Dr. Marr and his entourage, who is just as interesting as he is. I just want to state how this will work today. Uh, Dr. Marr is going to talk for about a half hour on topics concerning Jefferson and the Constitution, various different uh, time periods. Then I'm going to ask questions of Dr. Marr following that, and then there'll be an equally long time for you to ask questions as well. We have a microphone set up. And when we're done, we have books, which is courtesy, believe it or not, of Jefferson University for you. And Dr. Marr will actually sign a copy for you if you want to stay around and talk to him afterwards. So with that, with great pleasure, I'm looking really forward after, again, spending a very interesting afternoon with him, uh, Dr. Amar.
Well, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And I just want to uh, reiterate what you just heard. Um, there are free books um, for, uh, available to you. Um, I want to be straight with you. The real cost, and I'm so grateful to this university um, for making them available to you. And I'll be delighted to inscribe them however you like. But uh, um, truth in advertising, uh, I'm very straight. Um, the real cost of a book is actually the time that you will spend um, engaging with it. And uh, from that point of view, um, I'm asking for a lot of hours of your life. Um, and there are other things you could be doing, but I hope actually um, the experience will be um, worth uh, in the hope of enticing you not just to pick up a book, um, but to actually um, open it um, and uh, to start engaging it. I'm going to be sharing with you three excerpts from the book that I've composed specially for this event. This is Thomas Jefferson University. Um, so uh, the three excerpts are three slices of Jefferson, of Thomas Jefferson. The book is a much more sweet, the American constitutional experience from 1760 to 1840 what I claim are the first four score years, a tip of the hat to Abraham Lincoln, the first 80 years of the American constitutional experience, which begins before the constitution, before the declaration of independence. It actually begins for reasons that you will understand if you read chapter one of the book that begins in 1760. And then I, if, and chapter one is, punchline doesn't come till the end of that chapter. But by the end of that chapter, if you don't have a completely new understanding of the American Revolution and, and what is going to cause the American Revolution, <clears throat> I'll be disappointed. Um, so, um, but today, so it's a big book, 1760 to 1840. Uh, today, three excerpts that I've entitled uh, Three Slices of Thomas Jefferson. Slice one, July 4, 1776. Who really wrote the Declaration of Independence? Let's consider several possible answers. The Continental Congress did. That would be the people um, on your left. Uh, this is a painting, very famous one by John Trumbull. Uh, there are different versions of it. One, uh, the large version hangs in the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, DC. A smaller version hangs in the Yale University Art Gallery. The Continental Congress did. This is a good answer. The document technically came from Congress and Congress did significantly edit the committee draft especially by eliminating some idiosyncratic, and that we shall, we shall see, idiotic things that Thomas Jefferson had written about moral culpability for colonial slavery. This answer has the added advantage of being a dozen impressive statesmen who had in turn been selected by an even broader democratic base back in their home colonies. It was hardly unique to Jefferson. So the best answer of all is, and Jefferson sees the, the red-haired guy in the middle, tall guy. America did. That would be the rest of us watching, looking at this painting. All of us, we, the people. America, in effect, slowly refined and purified the precious metal of the Declaration in an extraordinarily wide and deep conversation between 1763 and 1776. That's why the book is about America's constitutional conversation, beginning in 1760, in fact. Jefferson was a stylish note taker, not a transcriptionist recording every word verbatim, but a good student summarizing and organizing the key points. At his more modest moments, this is indeed how Jefferson himself described the document in his role. Quote, the object of the declaration was not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, nor merely to say things which had never been said before, or humankind, the common sense of the subject. It was intended to be an expression of the American mind, harmonizing sentiments of the day, whether expressed in conversations, in letters, or in printed essays. Okay, you say, but what about women, American women in 1776? What about indigenous peoples, referenced by the uh, referred to by the, in the Declaration as, quote, merciless savages, unquote? What about American slaves, and American slavery? For starters, we must understand that on none of these issues were the British better than the Americans. Moreover, Americans had strong answers, non-hypocritical answers, answers that were genuinely defensible given the world they inherited 
that sought to remake on women and Native Americans. On slavery, however, Jefferson's declaration hypocritically sacrificed justice and truth, self-evident truth at that, on the alternative and military expediency. Women. Women did not vote, yet they were taxed by colonial assemblies and would continue to be taxed by new state governments in independent America. Many other legal impositions would also be heaped upon these non-voters. How could this be squared with the Declaration's principles? Consent of the governed and all of that. Because American male voters plausibly saw themselves as virtual representatives of the women in their lives, their wives, daughters, sisters, and mothers. American were not, not yet, claiming otherwise. They were not petitioning American men, the way colonists had petitioned the king and parliament. They were not writing women's suffrage essays, convening feminist or feminine assemblies, organizing um, all female committees of correspondence, engaging in female dis disobedience, boycotting men, or doing any of the things that patriots were doing to dramatize and explain their sense of agreement toward Britain. This apparent acquiescence would not last. Mid 19th century American women, like 50 years later, would indeed proliferate petitions for women's equality, pen and print suffragist books and essays, convene pro-women assemblies, organize feminist boycotts, and do much, much more. And when they did, they would in fact brilliantly echo and adapt the very language of the Declaration of Independence itself and iconic statements such as the Seneca Falls Declaration of 1848. The most pointed discussion of the rights of women came from the era's shrewdest political spouse, and it came notably in a private letter to her husband. The letter is now famous, but it was not published until the mid 19th century. On March 31st, 1776, Abigail Adams wrote to John that, quote, I long to hear that you've discovered, uh, that you've declared an independency, unquote. Then Abigail pivoted. This is a quote. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose will be necessary for you to make, I desire desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions, unquote. That's the language of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration did not condemn all Indians, just the ones allied with King George. Americans would happily ally with any tribes that would aid their cause, just as they would happily work with the French. As colonists, Americans such as Washington had fought against both the French and hostile tribes in a war that took its very name from that fact. It was the French and Indian War. The Declaration was quite frank about the real politique of international affairs. Free and independent states, quote, levy war, conclude peace, and contract alliances, unquote. The British people would no longer be America's brethren, that's the quote, and thus Americans would be obliged to, quote, hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends, unquote. The belligerent order in both formulations, war before peace, is worth noting. Don't mess with Americans. On matters of Indian affairs, Americans were essentially no better and no worse than the British. Both would use the Indian tribes for their own purposes. And in truth, Indian tribes in turn had tried and would continue to try to play European tribes off against each other. French against British um, in 1754 to 63, British against Americans after 1775. In 1776, the threat to Indian tribes from Amer the Americans was generally greater because Americans had vastly more boots, guns, shovels, axes, plows, horses, and oxen on the ground, and were indeed aiming to oust Indian tribes. Had the British prevailed in the Revolutionary War, they would doubtless have done much the same on their own schedule. And in fact, they did later dispossess most indigenous tribes in Canada. Americans, especially leading Virginians, were particularly frustrated by a 1763 royal proclamation that prohibited colonists from settling west of the Appalachian crest. Most of this pristine land seemed ripe for the taking. Indigenous peoples only thinly inhabited this region. Centuries, European diseases such as smallpox, influenza, and measles had ripped through native tribes and caused massive depopulation. By 1776, European Americans east of the Appalachians 
outnumbered Aboriginal folk between the mountains and the Mississippi by a ratio of roughly 20 to one. The massive displacement of native peoples would become an especially important issue in future decades. One way to introduce to note that British American notions of land and property differed dramatically from Native American concepts. British Americans in 1776 were Lockean, scholars of John Locke, not just in their embrace of a right of legitimate revolution against tyranny, but also in their ideas of land use and ownership. For Locke and his followers, the first person on a virgin continent was not entitled to claim legal, legal title over all that his eye could see and more. He could only own what he used in a certain way, only real estate that he cultivated and improved, only land with which he mixed his own labor. On this view, although Indians were using large swaths of land as areas for hunting and gathering, this use alone, somatic, did not entitle the natives to perfect ownership of, an absolute right to exclude others from, the entire region. Indians intensively cultivated only a small percentage of the land. In general, Northeastern native tribes lived in very different ways from say the Aztecs who confronted Spanish conquistadors in the early 16th century. Northeastern Indians did not build elaborate permanent structures on the land. They major roads through it, significantly improve its waterways, build notable bridges or dams across the streams and rivers, harness its wind or water with mills, clear or plant large portions of its acreage, measure it, bound it, register title to it, or commodify it so that it could eventually become, come into hands that would use it most efficiency, efficiently. As between Lockean understandings and tribal understandings, there was a massive cultural impasse and no easy conversational mechanism for resolving this impasse. More generally, Indian tribes were not active and effective participants in the emerging system of constitutional discourse that the British Americans were developing, in which colonials were fast approaching conversational parity with their English cousins. Leading colonists such as Adams and Jefferson had mastered the common law. Many colonial opinion leaders lived in bustling cities featuring grand multi-story brick structures such as the Boston Courthouse or the Pennsylvania State House, which is of course today known as Independence Hall. Colon colonists re wrote, read, sent, and received private letters at an astonishing rate, sustaining a strong and ever-expanding postal system headed at times by Benjamin Franklin. American-made trade ships plied the oceans on a par or nearly so with British-made trade ships, and British America boasted world-class scientists and inventors led by Benjamin Franklin and David Rittenhouse. Hope you know those names in this city. Good if small colonial institutions of higher learning abounded. Harvard, William and Mary, Yale, modern-day Princeton, modern-day Columbia, um, uh, Penn, uh, it used to be called, of course, the College of Philadelphia, uh, the College of Rhode Island, now Brown, Queens College, now Rutgers, and Dartmouth. The colonies had great political artisans and rising political artists, such as Paul Revere, Charles, Charles Wilson Peel from this city, and John Trumbull. Um, prizing literacy, mainland colonies printed and read books, pamphlets, newspapers, and broadsides prodigiously. Indeed, America's newspaper density and readership per capita would soon surpass. So I've actually given you some historical under, apologies for, for women and Native Americans. Can't do it for slavery, it doesn't work. Masters did not virtually represent the best interests of slaves the way John genuinely and plausibly understood himself to virtually represent Abigail. Slaves thirsted for freedom and ached to win it whenever and however possible. Newspapers teemed with ads offering rewards for the capture of runaways. Colonists themselves obviously understood all this and more when they referred routinely to objectionable British practices as tantamount to slavery. Nor did slaves constitute some different sovereign or quasi-sovereign entity like say the Mohawk or the Oneida or the Seneca. Slaves spoke the same language, lived in the same cities, towns and counties, in the same buildings sometimes as their masters. They were part of the same civilization and they were in daily conversation with masters and agents of masters. The explanation for the beam in the declaration's eye was geostrategic. The defeat of the British would require unity of all 13 mainland colonies. Franklin's join or die snake could not be divided. Unity meant agreement from South Carolina in particular. The South Carolinians were so wedded to slavery as the basis for their society that they were not even willing to discuss the institution in the 1776 Congress. Quote, if it's debated whether slaves are our property, declared South Carolina delegate uh, Thomas Lynch Jr., there is an end of the Confederation, unquote. 
Franklin's serpent had quite a sting in the tail, as it turned out. Thus was born a basic contradiction between what Americans professed at their best and what Americans practiced at their worst. As finally adopted, the Declaration's text muted the contradiction. The document assailed King George for, quote, exciting domestic insurrections amongst us, slave revolts, but said no more. In an earlier draft, Jefferson had passionately condemned the international and uh, domestic slave trade, though not quite slavery itself. The slave trade is different than slavery itself. It's just about bringing bodies over from, from Africa. Um, here's the quote of Jefferson's draft of the Declaration. Getting its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people them into slavery in another hemisphere um, the, um, to incur a miserable death in their transportation or to incur a miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of a Christian king of Great Britain. Determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold, he's prostituted his veto for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this exorable commerce, deplorable commerce. And that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguishing die, he is now exciting those very people to rise in arms against us, among us, and to purchase that liberty of which he's deprived them and murdering the people upon which uh, he had intruded them, thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people, the blacks, with crimes which he now urges them to commit against the lives of another, the white Americans, unquote. Very passionate and totally confused. But the King of England, the King and Parliament had not generally prevented masters from freeing their own slaves. The master's own greed had prevented that. Nor had the King and Parliament mandated that Americans buy and sell slaves domestically. If Americans could voluntarily refrain from buying black tea, why not black slaves? Jefferson's effort to shift blame away from himself and other masters was clumsy and confused and Congress wisely excised the entire passage. British critics sneered at the hypocrisy of American patriots in the 1770s. The classic line came a set from a 1775 pamphlet, Taxation, No Tyranny, by the ever quotable Samuel Johnson. Quote, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes, unquote. It was a great put down, a brilliant proto tweet from a distinguished Englishman whose opposition to slavery was sincere and abiding. But in the end, the last laugh was on Samuel Johnson himself, who in this reactionary pamphlet obtusely defended multiple acts of British oppression, openly embracing the widely discredited notion that parliament truly did satisfactorily represent America. Johnson notwithstanding, the British empire in 1776 was every bit as steeped in slavery as were the mainland colonies. The West Indies were even worse than South Carolina. True, in November 1775, Virginia's royal governor, Lord Dunmore, promised freedom to certain runaway slaves, the specific gravemen um, of the Declaration's grievance about royal incitement of domestic insurrections. But the cynicism of Dunmore's gambit was obvious on close inspection. Only slaves of rebels, not loyalists, would be freed. And only if they served in His Majesty's armed forces, fleeing from one servitude, to another. More generally, we must distinguish between freeing individual slaves, even many of them, and ending slavery as a system. Emancipation, also described as manumission, was not the same as abolition. Dunmore never proposed abolition, nor had any British official or entity. Most contemporaneous and previous regimes in world history allowed slavery of some sort and Few governments had ever adopted a sweeping and enduring ban on all forms of unfreedom. No major organization prior to 1775 had advocated for complete abolition. So freeing slaves is one thing. You see it in the Old Testament. You'll see it in, in the New Testament. You, you'll see it in, in Ben-Hur. Um, Charlton Heston gets, gets freed. You'll, you'll see it in a funny thing happen on the way to the form. Freeing individual slaves, yes. But I'm saying, what about ending slavery everywhere and all this? That idea wasn't in the world yet. But in 1775, there arose a remarkable civil society that aimed to end slavery itself. The society was formed not by Samuel Johnson, 
nor in Johnson's vault, vaunted London, nor indeed anywhere in British in Britain proper, but rather in, wait for it, Philadelphia, the host city of the Continental Congress. Two of the society's early leaders were Benjamin Franklin and Benjamin Rush, both of whom in the summer of 1776 added their names to the American Declaration of Independence. They're in that picture. That's where in the world the idea of abolition starts, right here in Philadelphia, where it started. The Society for the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage, that's the name of the society, was founded in Philadelphia in April 1775, same month as uh, Lexington Concord. The outbreak of war interrupted its activities. In 1780, thanks in part to its members, revolutionary Pennsylvania enacted a legal plan of partial emancipation and complete, albeit gradual, abolition. In 1787, the organization renamed itself, quote, the Pennsylvania Society for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery and the relief of free Negroes unlawfully held in bondage and for improving the condition of the African race, unquote. Franklin became its president, Rush its secretary. So there's some not so good stuff, but there's also stuff to be proud of. It's actually more Ben Franklin than Thomas Jefferson in slice one. It gets better for Jefferson, but not completely. Slice two, July 4, 1801, exactly 25 years later. Tom and, and Jefferson is the sitting vice president of the United States who's running against the sitting president. So you think like the tension between Pence and Trump was interesting. This is, this is way more than that, okay? Because he's running the sitting vice president against the sitting president. Thomas Jefferson, and he beats him. Thomas Jefferson's triumph over John Adams in the election of 1800-1801 meant that the Sedition Act was now dead and buried. The Sedition Act had made it a crime to criticize John Adams. The people themselves had in effect overruled the judges who had repeatedly upheld the oppressive act. Once in office, Jefferson worked to implement that, the inform, that informal electoral verdict. So this is some good stuff about Jefferson. Like, oh, finally, phew, you know. First, Jefferson and his fellow Democratic Republicans, who by the end of 1801 comfortably controlled the House and had roughly half the Senate, eschewed passing a new Sedition Act to replace the one that had just poofed into thin air. Rejecting tit for tat, they took no federal statutory steps to target their critics as their critics had once targeted them. Good for them. Second, Jefferson never tried to pursue anyone for sedition based on any sort of federal common law theory. Common law is you don't need a statute, you can just go after people. In later years, a Supreme Court dominated by men that Jefferson and Madison had selected and presided over by an Adams appointee, John Marshall, would emphatically declare that the Constitution did not contemplate federal common law crimes of any sort. No justice openly dissented from this landmark ruling, which is called United States versus Hudson and Goodwin, and is penned by Thomas Jefferson's first appointee, William Johnson. Johnson opened his opinion by proclaiming that the issue had, quote, been long settled since in public opinion, in no other case for many years has this jurisdiction been asserted and the general acquiescence of legal men shows the prevalence of opinion in favor of the Jeffersonian view of this matter. Third, so no new statute going after Jefferson's critics, no common law theory, that, hey, we don't need a law, we're just gonna prosecute people that criticize us. Third, President Jefferson took no steps to prosecute anyone for any writings or utterances that had occurred late in the Adams administration when the Sedition Act was still technically in force. The last section of that statute ended with a special proviso authorizing post-inauguration, pre-inauguration crimes. Of course, had Jefferson accepted the proviso's invitation, he would have placed his administration in the awkward position of prosecuting his own supporters. More awkward still, he himself had likely violated the Sedition Act while serving after all, he had the journalist James Callender's edgy anti adams pamphlet entitled The Prospect Before Us. That loan under the himself was punished for this. Jefferson himself equally guilty. And Jefferson's involvement in, in this didn't become public until 1802 when, when the journalist outed him. Um, um, and of course, Jefferson had secretly drafted the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798-1799, a fact not made public until the 18 teens, and had traded all sorts of related letters and other writings in connection with these resolutions, which had denounced the government, the Congress, and the president for this Sedition Act. 
These actions alone were arguably enough to convict under the Sedition Act's words in gloss and case law. But to repeat, no one was prosecuted under the Sedition Act on Jefferson's watch. And rightly so, given the true meaning of the Constitution as confirmed by the election of 1800. Only days after Jefferson took office, his attorney general, Levi Lincoln, informed a lower level federal prosecutor that, quote, the president of the United States had judged it inexpedient that any further prosecution should be commenced or continued under the sedition law. You will therefore take proper measures for staying and discharging all such cases. Fourth, and most dramatically, Um, case that um, he had inherited from the Adams administration against William Duane, the printing partner of the now dead Benjamin Franklin Bache, the colorful grandson of Benjamin Franklin himself. Jefferson expressly defended his actions on constitutional grounds. One particular emphatic statement appeared in the first draft of his first annual message to Congress. Here's the quote. I do declare that I hold this act to be impalpable and unqualified contradiction to the Constitution. Considering it then as a nullity, I have relieved from oppression under it those of my fellow citizens who were within the reach of the functions confided to me." Unquote. Um, he eventually dropped this passage at the urging of cabinet advisors, but he already said much the same thing over many months um, in letters to various correspondents. In a truly extraordinary and tart letter to Abigail Adams herself, the spouse of the person who signed the bill into law. John, in 1804, Jefferson minced no words. Here's the letter. And by the way, you can read all these letters. They're all freely available online at the National Archives um, website, which is National Archives Founders Online. Every single letter ever written to or from Jefferson, Adams, Madison, um, uh, uh, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, um, Alexander Hamilton. Um, uh, here's the qu quote to, from Jefferson to Abigail. I discharged every person under punishment or prosecution under the sedition law because I considered and now consider that law to be a nullity, as absolute and as palpable as if Congress had ordered us to fall down and worship a golden image, and that it was as much in my duty to stop its execution in every stage as it would have been to have rescued from the fiery furnace those who should have been cast into it for refusing to worship their image. It was accordingly done in every instance without asking what the offender had done or against whom he had offended, but whether the pains uh, they were suffering were inflicted under the pretended sedition law, unquote. Later, Congress would make further amends and would do so symbolically on the 14th anniversary of Jefferson's death. The act of July 4, 1840, which is where my book ends, you see, repaid Sedition Act victim Matthew Lyons fines with accrued interest. And the company committee report declared that the 1798 Act was, this is a quote, unconstitutional, null, and void. No question connected with the liberty of the press was ever more generally understood or so conclusively settled by the concurring opinion of all parties after the heated political contest of the day had passed away, unquote. Once in power, Jefferson and his successor, Madison, quietly abandoned several other elements of their early opposition politics that were constitutionally unsound. On various constitutional issues other than speech, they became Hamiltonians in practice, but never admitted it. For example, Jefferson and Madison in the 1790s had argued repeatedly and heatedly that Alexander Hamilton's National Bank was plainly unconstitutional. But as president, Jefferson enforced the national bank law as a law of undoubted constitutional validity, a dramatic contrast to his treatment of the Sedition Act. On President Madison's watch, Jefferson's congressional allies allowed the bank statutory charter to lapse in 1811. But then in the War of 1812, the absence of a central bank did indeed cause fiscal and military embarrassments, just as Hamilton had predicted decades earlier. In 1814, invading British forces torched parts of the White House and burned much of the capital to the ground. In 1816, a sheepish President Madison signed into law a new bank bill without a peep from Jefferson. When the constitutional issue reached the Supreme Court, the 1819 case of McCulloch versus Maryland, 
the court in a unanimous opinion by John Marshall echoed Hamilton's 1791 opinion letter to Washington at every turn and ruled that of course Congress could create a national bank. The court's opinion made mincemeat of Madison's and Jefferson's 1791 argument and twice called attention to the constitutional and policy about face that Jefferson, the Jeffersonians had recently executed on the issue. Of the seven jurists who participated, remember it was unanimous, two had been appointed by Adams, three by Jefferson, and two by Madison. In short, on key issues, Jefferson and Madison were more Hamiltonian than they cared to admit. Jefferson's self-proclaimed revolution of 1800 was thus at times, was thus at least in some measure, a matter of style more than substance. The Federalists had too often presented themselves as haughty and aristocratic, not sufficiently in touch with the common folk, especially Westerners, those who lacked formal education and those who worked with their hands. This stylistic failure haunted Federalists even when they truly were more egalitarian than their opponents. Um, um, and so, for example, Hamilton himself actually proposed all sorts of luxury taxes, and it was actually the Jeffersonians who opposed them. Okay. Um, um, and they had strong anti-slavery credentials and Jefferson and Madison, not so much. Um, um, but in the 1790s, these two brilliant Virginia blue bloods, Jefferson and Madison, began to master the democratic art of self-presentation, style and spin. Whereas Jefferson, a proud peacock, a spirited little animal, that's a quote, strutted in public and flaunted his fancy, his fancy public clothes, fancy clothes, silk gloves and silver buckled shoes, perhaps because he so painfully lacked finery in his deprived Dickensian childhood. Madison almost always wore drab black. He was a master of camouflage, adept at making himself an inconspicuous target. Jefferson was a political genius sartorially, as is evident by a simple comparison of two famous paintings of him that show not so much the revolution of 1800 as the stylistic redo, the fashion remake of 1800. There are lots of pictures in the book, and these are two of them. Mo Mather Brown's painting on the left captured Jefferson in London in 1786, several years before the diplomat returned to America. Behold the true American aristocrat, powdered and wigged, bedecked in lace and frills, seated along ele alongside elegant art and not directly engaging the viewer. His hand is fair and elegant, even dainty. Rembrandt Peel, he's a Philadelphian, son of Charles Wilson Peel. Rembrandt Peel's 1800 painting on the right is of an older man, a man vying for America's presidency, who's cleverly learned how to present himself to an increasingly and proudly democratic society. No more wig, powder, lace, frills or art. He fixes the viewer with his gaze directly and democratically. There's even a faint hint of a smile as he sees us. He's one of us, plain, simple, honest, direct, and thus we can trust him. Or at least that's what he wants us to think. Jefferson's rel Jefferson relentlessly attacks his political foes as advocates of American monarchy and aristocracy. As with much of Jefferson's writing, this charge was rhetorically brilliant, but intellectually lazy. In fact, Jefferson was in virtually every way himself a true hereditary monarch, ruling over others on his private mountain. <clears throat> he was a Virginia Randolph, his father's first son, born in wedlock and on high, destined by that high birth to eventually lord over hundreds of slaves born to serve him. None of Hamilton's sons, none of Hamilton's sons or sons-in-law would go on to political glory. Um, Jefferson, conversely, was two for two in transferring political power to the next white and legitimate generation. He sired no sons, but one son-in-law served as Virginia governor, as had he, and the other as a U.S. senator in the chamber over which he had presided as vice president. Jefferson's closest friend and lifelong ally, ally, James Madison, likewise brilliantly railed against ha Hamiltonian monarchism, but was himself a monarch cut from the same cloth as Jefferson. He too was a first born Virginia Lord who by dint of high birth inherited countless slaves, dying with more than a hundred and never freeing any of them. Humans treated far worse than George III generally treated his own royal subjects. 
last slice. Slice three, exactly 25 years later. July 4, 1826. What should we make of the most famous duel, D-U-A-L, not D-U-E-L, the famous, because I just in my book told you about the famous D-U-E-L death of Alexander Hamilton. The book is dedicated, among others, to uh, Lynn manuel Miranda um, and Ron Chernow. Um, why, what should we make of the most famous duel death in American history? The passing away of frenemies, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, on the same day, within hours of each other, in their homes far apart. The most important the improbable that these two men would die not just with one Adams mentioning the other Jefferson on his dying in his dying breath, even though they were of course not instantaneous contact. Not just because and not just on the anniversary of their most famous joint venture, the Declaration of Independence, but precisely on the silver anniversary, <clears throat> the 50th birthday of the United States, over which they had both presided, at first together almost. If this were a novel, it would be, it would be ridiculed as infinitely too pat. The odds against such a confluence of coincidence seem a million to one. But this confluence was not freakish in the way, say, that a previously unknown geyser, brieflessly and harmlessly erupting on the outskirts of Philadelphia, beginning precisely at high noon, July 4th, 1826, would be you know, like if something just sprouted up right in the middle of this lecture or something. Well, that would be impossible to explain except as a sign from God. The Adams and Jefferson deaths involved, by contrast, human agency, human willpower. The coincidence wore two faces, private and public. On the private side, taking each man separately, we can only marvel at the strength of will involved. Each man died knowing the date, waiting for it, and then expiring precisely on cue, like a great stage actor. Jefferson famously said, this is the fourth, um, or words to that effect. There is no record of his saying on each of the preceding days, this is the 30th, or this is the first, or this is the second, or this is the third. Each man willed himself to make it to the fourth. And then each sought natural release on that day and indeed willed it. No hemlock was involved. This was not the death of Socrates. Rather, each man let go and desperately wanted to end on the fourth and not say the fifth or the sixth. There would be far less glory on any other day, earlier or later. Jefferson had taken the opium laud laudanum in the preceding days and did not um, and did not refuse um, uh, and um, but he did refuse any more drugs once he thought he had made it to the fourth in fact his last recorded words were no doctor nothing more what kind of person is able to die on cue only a person of extraordinary will with an eye on history and an astonishing drive to be remembered and celebrated in a certain way the leading founders sought acclaim above all. The love of fame was, in the words of Hamilton's Federalist 72, quote, the ruling passion of the noblest minds, unquote. If America's great founders died on cue like actors, that is precisely because they were actors of a certain sort, intensely aware of their public audience. Thus, Adams and Jefferson each seemed aimed to die on a key American date, not a personal one. Not a special birthday or wedding anniversary, um, you know, not the death date of a famous parent or child. Each privately aimed for an American day connected to his greatest public moment, his involvement in the midwifing of the birth of America itself. For Jefferson, the declaration was all about its soaring words, words that he as a proud wordsmith had largely composed, and its grand ideas about revolution and about free and independent states. In fact, this last idea was repudiated by the Constitution itself, which is not about free and independent states. It's about an indivisible union. <clears throat> um, but Jefferson never understood this. And his namesake, Jefferson Davis, really never understood this. Um, and my recent, and my student, uh, uh, Noah Feldman, in a new book, he just says, really doesn't understand that, but that's another story. He was, Jefferson was, as has now been seen, an intensely willful man. And he could not see what he would not see. Just as in the end, 
he could not die on any day other than the day of his choice. Jefferson's attachment to the Declaration, his sense of special authorship of it, is in unmistak the unmistakable message of his gravesite inscription at uh, uh, Monticello, instructions for which he had composed well before July 1826. This is from his diary. On the faces of the obelisk, the following inscription and not a word more. Quote, here was buried Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, the Statue of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and Father of the University of Virginia, unquote. Because the, by these, as testimonials that I have lived, I wish to be remembered. Note that there's not a word in these instructions or in the final um, obelisk, for that matter, about the Constitution, about Jefferson's service under the Constitution as the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, or the third President. Jefferson wanted to be remembered because of the Declaration and wanted the Declaration to be remembered above all else. How perfect would it be if he could make it to the Silver Fourth? How imperfect would it be if he lasted past that day? His death plan was thus set long before the Silver Fourth, as was his gravestone inscription. To be sure, the gravestone was not yet inscribed, but the plan to carve it in stone um, uh, um, uh, via, uh, with, via his reference to the fourth, was indeed already metaphorically carved in stone. Okay, there's a little bit more, but I think I've given you um, an, enough of a sense of the thing. Um, uh, so, and I think I think we've reached sort of the the appointed hour. If you want to ask me about Adam's death that same day, going back to to that first one. I can tell you a little bit about what, what Adams is thinking on that very same day, and which is very different than what, what Jefferson is thinking. But these two friends, they're together on July um, 4th, 1776. And um, then they run against each other um, and, and Jefferson takes over and that's July 4th, 1801. And then exactly 25 years later, these two frenemies end up dying together. Um, and that's the last chapter of my book. Um, but I think um, I, I think I said enough to give you a little bit of a sense of, of three sizes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Amir, uh, I have some questions, especially regarding the what's known as the Great Compromise, um, which you cover in your book extensively. Um, which you, is available for free. Available for free at your local back table. Uh, Washington, as you say in your book, was the primary force behind this, um, as well as Hamilton. The need for a national army, especially the threat posed by France, Spain, and England, and of course, the need for a national economic system. So the compromise had to be made, or did it? See, that's something I've always heard about. It had to be made that to get Carolina in, three fifths of a human being for a black person, the continuing of slavery, and so forth. But did it have to be made? Could, was there an option available? Was there another way? It's uh, one of the great and most important questions of all of American history, human history, a couple of things. One, when I was a student, I used to say it just your way, three-fifths of a human being. But if you say it that way, you would think five-fifths would be better, right? Oh, a full human being. No, five-fifths would have been worse because the question isn't whether slaves vote. Slaves never vote anywhere. The question is how much credit in the House of Representatives and ultimately also in the Electoral College, slave states are going to get for the fact that they have slaves in their jurisdiction. And if you're anti-slavery, the principled answer should be zero. You should never get more seats in the House of Representatives. You should never get more seats, therefore, in the Electoral College, because the seats that you get in the Electoral College depend in large part on how many seats you have in the House of Representatives. You should never have more seats because you have slaves. So, so the principled argument uh, number should have been zero. You never get extra credit for extra slaves. So did they have to actually give South Carolina 
um, and, and other slave states, this, this extra um, uh, credit. And, and you might think, okay, well, how big a difference does it make? Here's how big a difference it makes. Um, in 1800, 1801, here's what you were all taught. Thomas Jefferson beats John Adams. Without three-fifths, Thomas Jefferson doesn't beat John Adams. Jefferson wins overwhelming in the South. Adams wins overwhelming in the North. And without more free people voted for John Adams. But because Virginia's electoral votes and South Carolina's electoral votes and North Carolina's electoral votes are artificially inflated by three-fifths, um, some 13 extra electoral votes in all, Jefferson ends up winning by eight electoral votes rather than losing. No, um, uh, uh, nine elections are won by a slaveholding Virginia. In 1800, Pennsylvania has more free people than Virginia, way more voters than Virginia because it has lower property qualifications, way fewer electoral votes than Virginia because Virginia is getting a lot of credit for the 40% of its population that are slaves. So just to repeat, eight of the first nine presidential elections are won by a Virginia. Um, um, until 1860, every single president is either a Southerner, a slaveholding Southerner, or a Northern man of Southern sympathies or an, an, an appeaser who plays footsie with the South. And you say, oh no, John, John Adams wasn't that way. He didn't like slavery. Yeah, but his running mates were two South Carolinians named Pinckney. Oh no, Professor, John Quincy Adams wasn't like that. I saw the movie Amistad. He was old man eloquent against slavery. Yes, when he was no longer president, when he was actually, you know, merely having to represent his Massachusetts district, which is emphatically anti-slavery. As president, his vice president was a South Carolinian, just ridiculously pro-slavery named John C. Calhoun. Okay, so until Abraham Lincoln, no president ever says anything like the following. Slavery is wrong and we should eventually get rid of it. No cabinet officer prior to Lincoln ever says that. And that's three-fifths. So three-fifths turns out to be a very big deal. Now, was there an alternative? Because you need South Carolina on board because that snake, if South Carolina is not on board, South Carolina cuts a deal with the British, they land their troops there and now they're slicing into North Carolina. And once they're in North Carolina, they're into Georgia and you can just you can do the geography yourself because Philadelphia is next, okay? So you need 13, you need a united front. Um, in World War II, the analogy would be, see, once the Germans actually, once France completely folds, the Germans actually um, control all the coastline. It's gonna be difficult for the, um, the allies to get a beachhead, to, to get a toehold, to break into that. If Americans can basically create an alliance up and down the coastline, they have a shot against the British. The British are three times as big as they are and much more advanced economically. So, so, so you need to get them on board, but did you have to do it this way? Now, I cannot prove as an historian that there was some other alternative. I can only tell you what did happen. I can't prove definitively the way a physicist could with billiard balls or something about Newton's laws of motion or something. But here's my actual belief. There was another way and they missed it. Here's what they should have done, but didn't. Um, and um, it's the solution that a state like Pennsylvania uses. It's a solution that appears elsewhere in the constitution. It's a solution that Lincoln will eventually champion. Here's the problem, okay? The world is fallen, you know, it's unjust. Um, but the arc of history needs to bend toward justice. How, how does that happen? Okay, so here's what Lincoln says. Slavery is wrong. Here's a direct quote. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember a time I did not so think and, and, and so feel. Feel, not just think. So, I mean, it's visceral for Lincoln. Slavery is wrong. And yet our entire way of life depends on big carbon. I mean, a slavery. Um, um, I get confused about these things. Okay, so... Our world today depends on carbon and we got to get rid of it, okay? Our world is, you know, slavery is wrong and our entire system is based on it. Thesis, it's wrong. Antithesis, it's how our system is based. What's the synthesis? Time. 
We must put slavery, says Lincoln, on a path of ultimate extinction. It might take 100 years, but that's what we need to aim for. First, we should prevent its expansion in the West, and then we can do some other things. Okay, what does the Constitution say? Not about slavery itself, but the international slave trade, which Jefferson was, was you know, um, 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 uh, writing about um, in the part of the Declaration that got excised. We can't prohibit the international slave trade today because South Carolina is going to squawk. But we say in 1808, it can be prohibited. And it actually was in 1808. It would be even better if it said it must be prohibited. And the person who's president when it's prohibited is named Thomas Jefferson. And he signs his name to that bill. So um, what does Pennsylvania do? They, they have slaves. They want to get rid of it. They put it on a path of slavery of gradual emancipation. So here's what they could have done and didn't. And, and this was available to them intellectually because Pennsylvania is doing something like this. 1808 is a version of this. OK, three-fifths now. Hell, four-fifths. But in 1810, it'll be two fifths. And in 1830, it will be zero fifths and you won't be getting extra credit for slaves. And we can haggle about the price, you know, about what the, the slope is of, of the carbon tax or whatever. Five cents today, 10 cents next year, 20 cents year after. And I haven't told you what the denominator is because we can haggle over, over the price, okay? That's what they could have done. I, I can't prove that it would have worked, but I say that's what they, and here's the problem, and, and here's, my, my view of what actually would have happened if they'd done it. And slavery isn't one thing, it's about 10 different things and they all need to be put on a path of gradual uh, el el elimination. We have to get rid of the slave, international slave trade. We have to get rid of the interstate slave trade. We have to get rid of slavery in the West. We have to get rid of the fugitive slave clause. Um, we've got to actually improve the status of free blacks in America. They're, they're, slavery isn't one thing, there are a whole bunch of, but on all of these things, we could say, okay, the rules are the, the following for now, but eventually, actually, um, we, the arc has to bend toward justice. So would the South Carolinians have go, gone for that? No, uh, I believe. Um, the technical, the South Carolinians are, and this is a technical political science term, bat shit crazy. <laughs> they think slavery is a good thing. They've always thought it's a good thing. And they're not so. You, but you, and, and in today's world, that would be Kim Jong-un. He's batshit crazy. Okay, you can't reason with him. But you don't have to, because at the end of the day, you don't have to persuade the South Carolinians. You have to persuade the Virginians. Today, that would be, you have to persuade China, and they will lean on North Korea. And I think you could have persuaded the Virginians, because Thomas Jefferson dies a slaveholder. He only frees a few slaves, all of whom are in the Hemings family for you know, uh, reasons that we now understand very, very well. Thank you, Annette Gordon-Reed. Um, but um, Madison doesn't um, uh, 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 free his slaves. So they're bad and they're hypocrites and I really criticize them in the book. But in their hearts, they know slavery is wrong. They're not South Carolinians. The analogy would be like someone who is a tobacco smoker who hates it, but addicted, he can't quit, but he does not want his grandkids to start. That's the Virginians. They are slaveholders who actually don't like slavery, but they, you know, um, and and so the the, the um, and George Washington will uh, on his deathbed provide for the freeing of his slaves. That's why he's so much greater than Thomas Jefferson um, or James Madison, on my view. So I think you could have come up with a sliding scale system, um, phasing the thing out. South Carolinians are going to hate it, but the Virginians are going to be on board, and that's a different world. Uh, so I want to ask one question, because one more, because I know the audience wants it as well. Um, James McCloy, who was Assistant Secretary of State under FDR, when he was giving advice on the, uh, as they were called, the relocation of American Japanese citizens to camps, when asked about the, the effect of the Constitution, said the Constitution is just a piece of paper. Uh, and in many times in our history, including Lincoln, uh, when he took over or smashed some of the printing presses, the Constitution has become a piece of paper. And more importantly, recently, there's been threats to our civil rights. How much of our constitutional democracy depends on the good faith of our leaders? How strong is that document? Or is it just a piece of paper, as McCoy said? Well, of course, it's just a piece of paper in a certain sense. but. Um, if it's a piece of paper that lives in the hearts and minds, not just of the leaders, but the American citizenry, well, then 
it's pretty darn important. It's one of the most important pieces of paper in the history of the world. If we allow it to be, if we uh, uh, allow it to be at all times close to our hearts. Um, so um, I'm going to pull out at least one other copy because I always have at least two. But um, uh, this is actually from the National Constitution Center. Um, ah, trove. Uh, oh, here's another one. Here's another two. At least. Okay. Um, uh, uh, just a quick plug while he's looking. Uh, Professor Amir was one of the primary people responsible for bringing the Constitution Center I'm, I'm to very Philadelphia. I'm oh. very proud of it, and it was good for Philadelphia and good for America and good for the world because I wanted to live in people's hearts. Along with all inspector. You know, and you shouldn't take it for granted and can't right now. Um, but if it lives in your heart, if you actually know what it's about, not just the, the, the government officials, but ordinary citizens, then that's how it's actually enforced. Now, you said a couple of things. I think Lincoln was actually quite faithful to the Constitution in, in general. Um, that's contrary to the thesis of a new book. It just was released yesterday by one of my students. His name is Noah Feldman. It's called the Broken Constitution. And he says Lincoln basically disregarded the Constitution. I, I don't think so. Um, I think Lincoln actually cared intensely about the Constitution and tried to be very faithful to it. I think it lived in his heart. And I think if it lives in ours, then that would be a huge you know, uh, force in the world. I'll tell you two stories. So um, uh, Gandhi was once asked what he thought of Western civilization pause for a moment, he said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> um, uh, now, I think the things in the Constitution, they would be a good idea, but they only work if actually you know what's in there. And it's a half hour to read the thing. But my own view, quite honestly, and very self-servingly also, is that you won't fully understand it unless you actually know the historical context and the backdrop, which is why I write these long books. And, and and they're free today, thanks to Thomas Jefferson University, but they will be absolutely inert. Pieces of paper and heavy ones at that, unless actually you read them. I'm a virus and I have to get into your body, into your head for this, these ideas. To, to, but once you actually understand why we did these things, then you'll be in a position to actually um, defend them against people in government who, if you let them, they'll do all sorts of stuff. They'll, they'll steal elections. They will. Okay. But if you understand the backdrop of the thing, if it lives in your heart, you know, you, um, um, uh, then, then it's enforced. Um, my second illusion, and I'm probably already dating myself. You're probably too old to be the Harry Potter generation, but, but, you know, some of you may know Harry Potter. So, um, um, in the, 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 the last book, um, The Deathly Hallows, there's this sort of otherworldly scene uh, that, that Harry seems to think is happening in, in King's Cross, a, a railroad station. And, and at a certain point, he says to, to Dumbledore, um, um, is this real, this conversation that we're having, or is it only in my head? And Dumbledore says to him, well, of course it's in your head. Where else would it be, my dear boy? But what makes you think that that doesn't make it real? She's amazing, um, J.K. Rowling. I, I think she's an impressive writer. And I cried at reading that uh, last book especially. But it has to be in our heads, you know, and in our hearts, because it's just, I mean, there's no magic here, you know, when Guardium Leviosa or something like that. I mean, you know, so, so it's, it is just a piece of paper and that's all it will be unless you actually know what it is and make it yours, um, and then, oh my God, it's one of the most important things to ever happen in human history. Thank you, that's a great segue for questions. Uh, open up to it, uh, any questions, raise your hand and go to the microphone over there. And of course, introduce yourself at the mic. Um, 
Hi, my name is Blue. I'm a student here. So you talk about making the Constitution yours, and I think that it's a wonderful document with a lot of historical um, significance, but I'd like to hear your opinions on how the Constitution applies to today. We live in a uh, drastically changing world with a lot of um, events that are firsts. It seems like every day we have a new first. How do we apply um, an out-of-date document to today's government and society? So I hear you, but I'll also be really honest with you. I don't have a lot of time, so I have to be honest. I hear you and it's a cop-out, okay? It's a cop-out for actually not doing your homework. Um, because you can't change the world. You can't bend history unless you actually know history. And I'm telling you that as an historian, because no one, you know, we're all born into the world and we didn't choose to be, and we inherit all sorts of stuff and it sucks. And, and there's injustice and everything is always out of date, you know, because it came before I came along, okay? They thought so too, but they studied history to know how to improve it. And unless you actually study, you won't know what to improve, what actually is good and what's not good. You won't have studied how they changed the freaking world, okay? Because this is the world before September 15, 1787. And I'm picking that day for a reason. You look around the planet and there's very little democracy in the world. And and that's not just, uh, there's, there's Britain, which has some self-government, although there's a king telling other people what to do and no one voted for. Him. And there's a house of lords that has massive political power and no one ever voted for them. But there's some democracy in Britain. There's some in Switzerland, although basically no one lives in Switzerland. Um, there are more sheep and goats than there are human beings. Um, and that's about it on the planet. Up, apart from the United States, what, what's gonna become, what is the, the burgeoning United States of America, um, the Dutch are in the process of losing their self-government. That's it for self-government in the world on September 15th, 1787. And not just 1787, 1786, and 1686, and 1586, and all the 86s back to the dawn of time. This is what the world looks like every year with vanishingly few exceptions. The world is filled with kings, emperors, czars, sultans, Mughal lords, tribal chieftains, thugs all. In the beginning, it's Kim Jong-un and Adolf Hitler and Saddam Hussein and Mao Zedong and thugs all. That's the world. For almost all of history, there was a little moment when, uh, the, when the ancient Athenians were able to achieve some self-governance. They also had slavery, of course, as did all ancient societies. The, the, societies. the Romans made a go of it for a while, and then that project collapsed. You can't take democracy for granted, you see. But in the history of the world, there's very little. Okay, it's all out of date. Yes, and by the way, they're still bowing and scraping to unelected people in Britain today and in lots of other places. But here's what I can tell you. In part, because of things that happened in this city in September 1787, when the constitution actually went public, was published in newspapers by publishers and printing presses. Um, and they, there wasn't yet a first amendment, but, but there was freedom of the press. In part because of that, that's the big bang of human history where for an entire year, an entire continent talked about whether we were gonna say yes or no to this proposal. That's what the preamble actually is saying. We, the people, not we the delegates, we the people do ordain and establish this document and the world would never be the same. An entire continent for an entire year deliberating on how they and their posterity, that would be us. And they weren't my forebears genetically, my, my forebears are halfway across the world um, in the sub Indian subcontinent, but they actually were trying this audacious idea called self-government, democracy, republicanism, potato, potato, they're all different versions of the same, they say, and here's your world today, just so you're clear. Because yes, it's out of date and like everything that you're wearing was created because of a civilization, you know? So my friend, Andy Lipka is with me and we have kids and, and here's their attitude. It's my life, but you pay for it. Okay, so everything that we inherited, we inherited all the good stuff too, as well as the debts that we owe uh, because of stuff that happened in the past. Okay, we need to understand it because here's your world today. It's a world in which half the planet governs itself, is democratic by population and land mass in a way that was never true before. My parents are still alive. My dad's in his 90s. I called him earlier 
um, uh, today and, um, and, and my mom's still around. When they are born in undivided India, a king halfway across the world is telling what to do, and a parliament that they never voted for halfway across the world telling what to do, just like the American colonists. And today, a billion people with a B are governing themselves with a written constitution, free and fair elections, multiple political parties, they're alternating power, fair amount of, of religious toleration. It is not remotely perfect, but neither is America in the era of Trump. Okay, But compare that to when they were born, and, and, and France is now an impressive republic at the time, it was an absolutist monarchy. It's not as good as California, true, today's France is not. Uh, California is much better to its Muslim population than France is, but it's not bad. Germany's not bad. All of Western Europe, much of Central Europe, um, Japan, okay. That, um, here's my claim. All of that is the military, political, economic, legal, cultural, social success of this audacious project. It began in a certain respect in this very city, um, putting a document to a vote up and down a continent. And the first people thing people say is, dude, you forgot the rights, which is gonna generate a bill of rights. This is, this is the big bang in human history to actually crowdsource, to ask ordinary people what they think um, about how, and so, it's too, e I'm being straight with you, it's too easy, too much of compensation, it's all out of date. You don't know what's out of date and what makes sense because it's enduringly true unless you actually study history. So here's my challenge to all of you. You at the very least, at a minimum, you need to know your presidents, all of them. At eight years old, I could, I could stand up and close my eyes and say, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, all the way through. And when I was 10 years old, my parents, and I thanked them yesterday for this and this morning, they brought me to Philadelphia. They're doctors from India. They brought me to Philadelphia. I went to Independence Hall, it changed my life, okay? So yeah, it's outdated and all the rest, but that's too easy a cop out. You must know your history, otherwise we're freaking doomed. We are, and, and, and only after you know it, can you decide what would be an improvement and what wouldn't, how people before you actually did massive change, how, how, how we ended slavery, um, how we went from a pro-slavery constitution with a three-fifths clause and a fugitive slave clause to an anti-slavery constitution because of a lawyer named Lincoln, who I actually think loved the constitution in his heart and didn't actually um, treat it with contempt, unlike what my friend Noah Feldman is saying in this heinous new book of his, um, uh, the, the Broken Constitution. Um, so let's have a debate. I'm happy that, you know, here, okay. But, but you need, so, so the question is, what's outdated and what isn't? You know, what made sense for some reasons then and doesn't make sense today? What made, uh, maybe made sense for one set of reasons and makes sense today for different reasons? And, and yeah, what doesn't make sense at all? You, you, so, but the only, and I'm being fierce here, the only way you can do that is you read your constitution, know your presidents, and actually ultimately read books like that one. And read Noah Feldman's on the other side too, so you can decide for yourself. You know, um, I, I start with this one because um, it's better. Um, it, it is. I'm being straight with you. I don't have a lot of time and I'm not, a, I'm a no bullshit person. Okay, and I'm actually telling you why Donald Trump is elected because young people don't show up to vote. Um, and even if they occasionally show up on presidential years, they don't show up in midterms. And you know, this is not you, you guys are the ones who are showing up, you know, but, but your generation has to show up because if it doesn't, we're all doomed. And you need to know your history and it's just too easy to say, ah, history, outdated, blah, blah, blah. It's a cop out, being honest with you. Thank you. I cannot tell you. I, I don't know if I need this. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so really, I'm, I'm thrilled. Yes. Read history, study it, enjoy your American studies classes. That's an order. Um, I'm going to go from the sublime to the ridiculous and ask you about John Adams' death. John Adams' is his death. You oh. promised to tell oh. us that story, oh. and I'm tantalized by it. Okay. So, that okay by everybody? Uh, 
I'll just read you just a couple of pages. So thanks for the invitation. Um, um, so, and John Adams, it's hard, he's got to make it to his, you know, um, uh, past his 90th birthday. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, but there was an obvious difference between the two men who seemed to die in perfect harmony. Adams was obsessed by Jefferson, but not vice versa. Jefferson made no recorded mention of Adams at or near the end, whereas Adams's last words were, Thomas Jefferson still survives. In fact, Jefferson had predeceased Adams by a matter of hours, um, but though there was no way that Adams could possibly have known that given the fact that took, um, at the time it took news to travel in 1826. Believe it or not, they don't have the internet. You know? They don't have you know, texting. Okay. Um, there's something oddly apt in old Adams's last words, and one aspect of the aptness is that old Adams was in fact wrong, and he was often wrong, but in interesting ways that reveal something about him and his world. Um, he wanted his collaboration with Jefferson remembered. When he was a young man, he actually was a team player, and as he got older, he got crankier and lost that ability. Um, and, and so there's something poignant that he's still trying to remember, you know, back when he and Jefferson really were um, uh, uh, friends. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so what's going on at the end of their life when they, um, they, they sort of um, renew this friendship? Um, here's, I think, what was going on. Um, old Adams felt humiliated by his loss to Jefferson, uh, to Jefferson. Um, but if Jefferson, but if he could convince himself that Jefferson was really always his friend, which is what he says in a bunch of these old letters, then he hadn't really entirely lost. He'd simply passed the baton. Um, now, by late 1809, Jefferson himself had passed the baton to Madison. Um, um, and old Adams was beginning to think about what might happen next. Unlike other leading founding fathers, old Adams had a son, um, a namesake, John Quincy. Perhaps John Quincy himself could be president, but only if old Adams made, it, made a lasting peace with the Virginia dynasty, with Jeff and with Jefferson in particular. Um, so, you know, and Adams is my, I think, you know, um, uh, he whose son wins last, laughs best. Um, when old Adams died, his son was indeed in the executive mansion as president of the United States. And, um, um, and Madison might even win a second term that the father had not, if backed by Jefferson. You know, he's hoping that you know, Jefferson might help Johnny Q you know, win against the madman Andrew Jackson. Um, for all the unreliability of old Adams' claims, there's still a deep truth lurking in all the falsity. Adams and Jefferson had not dined alone in 1776. They had dined together and worked together, along with others, of course. And amazingly, they died just as they lived, together in a way, but also apart. So there's something really poignant here. At the end of my book is it's, um, it's called Adieus. Um, it's the book, the chapter one is called Seeds, which is in quotes, it's actually a, a word that John Adams used, what were the seeds of the revolution? And John Adams, this is a bit of a spoiler, but not much, thinks the revolution had to have begun with him in the room because he was the most important guy. So he says, for, you know, Patrick Henry, forget about him, forget about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, all these Virginians. No, it started in Boston even before they were in the picture. That's when the seeds of the American Revolution were sown. That's where the child independence was born. It was in 1760, which is uh, in 61. That's my opening chapter. And that's old John Adams saying that's when it really started. And, and at first it seems kind of preposterous. John Adams is just a megalomaniac, but there's actually a way in which this is true. Um, it did, so, so there was something true there, okay? So that's my first chapter and it's about how everything begins. My last chapter is called Adieus in chapter, and what I do is I bring all my characters back on stage, especially the, the major figures of the American Revolution. By acclamation, the six great figures of this era, the founders are first four presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, plus Hamilton and Franklin. They're the big six. And I talk tell you a lot about them and their relationships. And, um, and at the very end, 
Now it's 1840, I bring them all back on stage one last time and kill them all off and tell you actually, you know, about, and, and Franklin goes first and I didn't get a chance to talk to about Franklin because this isn't Benjamin Franklin University. But if I were giving a talk at Penn, of course I talk about Benjamin Franklin who is epic and is proposing abolition in 1790. Good for him and is present of this abolition society in the world, the idea of ending slavery everywhere and all this it begins in Philadelphia in 1775. Never forget that. Okay, so don't tell me about outmoded ideas and stuff because that idea is not outmoded. And there's slavery in the world today. There's sexual slavery, there's child slavery. So it's not an outmoded idea that we should just get rid of it everywhere. Pull them off one by one. I mean, it's like in a movie. And uh, so, so if you've ever bought, you know, the stage is just littered with bodies or something. So I kill Franklin off. Well, I mean, I don't, but you know, it, it, I narrate the scene. And then um, a George Washington, and then the duel, which is amazing between Hamilton and Burr. And then the D-U-A-L um, deaths of, of um, Adams and Jefferson. And the last to go is James Madison. And each one, there's something really poignant about how they um, leave the stage. And there's a lesson for us. And I don't think it's, it's just outdated out mode. I think there are things we can learn about each of those for today. There was that hand. Was there one, one more hand. Obviously, abolish of slavery, but um, in the United States, black men make up 6.5 of the United States population, but make up 40.2 of prison population. So my question to you is, do you believe that the mass incarceration that we have in the United States is the modern way of slavery for men of color? It's a very deep and hard question. I want to read you the language of the 13th Amendment that Michelle is uh, alluding to because it's interesting and important. Here's what the 13th Amendment to the Constitution says. This is Lincoln's amendment. He signs his name to it. Technically, presidents don't play a role in the amendment process. Two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate, three quarters of the states, but he actually put his name on it. It got accidentally sent to him and he signed it. And that's what the movie Lincoln is all about, the Spielberg movie. And it's short, but here's the first sentence that Michelle is mentioning. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So what about that whole exception language? What do we think about it? Um, are, is the prison industrial complex today like a modern form of slavery? Um, and um, and I think people can take different positions on that question. Um, but I do want to tell you um, where that language came from. That language is word for word for word from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which began as an ordinance, um, an er earlier draft um, in 1784 and 85. The original drafter of that language, uh, of the early version, was a fellow named Thomas Jefferson. It is adopted by the Confederation Congress in 1787 in New York, meeting simultaneously with the Philadelphia Convention, a meeting in Philadelphia that's going to propose the Constitution. It's adopted and it prohibits slavery in the territories, makes the territories free soil, but with this proviso. And this proviso. Um, and that whole language has a kind, is kind of sacred language for many Americans, for a, a young boy named Lincoln who's going to grow up in the Northwest um, and be governed by the Northwest Ordinance. And my friend Ray Agron over there, he's from Illinois, so I saw him like nodding his head because because he's a Lincoln guy and he he knows how important the Northwest Ordinance is. If you, I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, if you're from the Midwest, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana. The Northwest Ordinance is kind of like the Declaration of Independence in its significance. Interestingly, the first draft came from Thomas, you know, a version of it came from Jefferson. Um, Lincoln, this was 
very natural language for Lincoln. So, and, and, and that's in part why they, they, they put it um, in there. Um, I, I know I haven't answered your question. I'm, give, I'm, I'm an historian telling you, you need to understand where things come from. And, and, and you could modify it, although I'm not sure we can frankly, honestly, just get rid of all prisons in America. And if people have done bad things, um, uh, we need to protect um, a society from them. Um, and if it's costing a lot of money to put them in prison, should they pay for part of the, the, the cost of their own incarceration? That's the argument on the other side, which you'll start to feel more when you pay taxes uh, big time, um, which you should look forward to doing because it mean, will mean that you're, you're, you're making money big time. And if you make money big time, you should pay taxes big time. Alexander Hamilton believes that and so do I. That's, um, so, so it's tricky, but I want you to know where it comes from. It comes from Lincoln, yes, but also interestingly from Jefferson. Um, and you won't know that unless, again, you study your history. Um, and it's a nice question whether that proviso makes any sense anymore, whether we should get rid of it. There's a documentary called 13, um, lots of different positions on that. But if you're gonna get rid of it, what are you gonna substitute for it? No prisons at all anywhere. How's that going to work? Are there societies that so so? But those are just the question to ask. Um, but this book does talk about um, chapter th uh, four in particular as a whole discussion of the Northwest Ordinance, which is one of the great texts of the American Revolution, alongside state constitutions and the Article of Confederation, the Constitution. Final point: Jefferson begins as a young man being very idealistic, trying to hear his first draft said get rid of slavery in all the territories, not just in the Northwest, but even in the Southwest territories. No slavery in the West anywhere. That's the first draft of, of Jefferson. And it comes within a vote of actually passing. And, and one guy was sick that day. So you've got to show up on elections, believe it or not. Okay. So um, that's who Thomas Jefferson is at the beginning. He's a very idealistic young man. But this arc guy trace in this book is he gets worse as he gets older. It's like Jackson Brown's The Pretender or something. He starts out so young and strong, and then he becomes. So by the, later in his life, he's actually going to oppose extension, the uh, prohibition on slavery's extension in the Missouri Compromise. He begins by saying, we shouldn't extend slavery. We should limit it. And he ends up at the end of his life basically saying, let's spread this virus, because that, that, that'll be the way to, to, to end it, by spreading it. Um, so you, so I'm, I'm harsh on Jefferson, but you can't be an American today. You really can't without coming to grips with Jefferson and Lincoln. They're up there on Mount Rushmore. They're the co-founders. They're the founders of our two political parties. It's been the same two political parties dominating every American election, local, state, and federal for over 150 years. It's won by a Republican or Democrat. And the Democrats were founded by Jefferson and the Republicans were founded by Lincoln. And they're up there on Mount Rushmore. You can't understand any of that without coming face to face, yes, with Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. And that language of the 13th Amendment that you asked me about is a very good illustration of all of that. Here's one final wrinkle. I was telling my friend A, Ray this. Today's Democrat Party, we say, oh, we descend from Jefferson, um, but we actually, our principles are much more like Lincoln. The tall, skinny constitutional lawyer from Illinois um, today is Barack Obama. So, so today it's the Democrats that basically have the Republican coalition and the, formally the, the party of Lincoln, the grand old party formally, they're the party of the Confederacy of Southern white aggrievement, you know, the party of, of, of Jefferson Davis, um, you know, um, so, so wow, history has all sorts of complexities and twists and turns and who knows what the future will bring. That's gonna be up to your generation, but you can't think about that straight without actually first asking, where did those words come from and why? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we can go on all night, but um, I have to get home to eat dinner. <laughs> so um, I want to thank Dr. Amar very much for a very interesting and enlightening conversation and remind everyone that the books are in the back. They're free or in the front. Thank you very much. Thank you.